um, we're going to continue with the long evening on the free server talk. So if we could get ready. So actually, before we really start with the uh, longitudinal stuff, I had two small uh, announcements, basically. One is, I don't know if you're aware of our free server page. So there is a Facebook free server page. So there is a page in uh, Facebook, and one thing is kind of is strange. Um, it's this number. It's like, why isn't it 500? So if you want to be the number 500, then like us now. <laughs> and, you know, we're trying to get to 500 since a while, and today I checked it's 499. <laughs> Maybe it's still 499. We also have a page for the course, um, and uh, we, we actually thank the person that is uh, going. <laughs> so it's one person going. I don't know who you are, but thank you. <laughs> okay, so now let's get let's get back to free surfer. So basically, what you've learned today is the um, uh, the basic free surfer tools for um, computing cortical um, thickness, computing subcortical structures, volumes, comparing things across subjects, across populations. I think that's what you've done today, mainly is the uh, analysis, but. Um, what happens if you have several time points <clears throat> from the same subject? So this is um, 14 time points, six years of Huntington's disease, and you can clearly see the changes, um, the ventricles growing, the corpus callosum bending upward and thinning. And still you see that what's all the anatomy is the same, right? It's the same subject. So how can we make use of this information that lots of the stuff stays the same and there's local changes? And that's the longitudinal free surfer pipeline. We're trying to exploit uh, the information that we know this is the same subject at different time points. Um, this will help us to reduce the variability on, um, on the estimates that we're getting, and thus we can detect much smaller changes or use less subjects um, to get the same power in our statistics. Let's see if there's a plot here. Uh, so this will help us to better measure atrophy, to measure changes in the brain and to better estimate time to onset of some symptoms, for example, or to, to study drug effects. Um, now, why is longitudinal so interesting? So basically, if this is a cross-sectional study, just an example, you would have, let's say, age and whatever, reading ability, or I don't know. Um, then this data would look like there is a decay in whatever you're measuring, right? That's what you would do if you fit the line. Now, if you had longitudinal data and you know who is who, you could actually find out that probably, maybe, um, there is even a faster decay in each subject than the cross-sectional data tells you. So there is a difference between longitudinal and cross-sectional, or it could also be this picture, where you actually see an increase uh, longitudinally, but cross-sectionally there isn't a decay. Right? This could, for example, be if you introduce a new reading program in a high school, and you start with the smaller kids first, you know, then they are already higher up. You know, there could be an explanation for this. But this is interesting, you can distinguish these things. Another example where you have, let's say, a young and an old population, and you have some data points, you compute the mean and the standard deviation, you do your testing, and you don't find any significant differences between these two groups. But if this was longitudinal data, you don't know who is who, you can connect the lines, and then you can come up with a very uh, exact estimate of a 3% change uh, in this study. Um, so that's why longitudinal data is and longitudinal studies are so interesting. Now, there is a few problems in the processing step. Uh, one is called the over-regularization. So sometimes some methods um, enforce temporal smoothing. That means they make the data smooth across time. And this is not, not really a good idea, because you assume the data is going smoothly. But it could be that there is one time point where it goes up. You know, who knows for whatever reason you gave a drug in that time point. You never know. So it could be that goes up or down. Um, we want to find these changes. We don't want to a priori smooth out anything. Um, so often this uh, this is to an underestimate uh, an underestimation of change. And then there's another big problem is the bias. So sometimes um, you don't treat all time points the same. You take one time point as the target, usually it's the baseline time point, and then you take follow up time points and map them to the baseline space. That's problematic because this baseline image is not uh, mapped anywhere. It just stays where it is. The follow-up images get mapped and resampled, 
and that's a smoothing that you basically introduce to the follow-up images and not to the baseline image. So you'll find some change even if there is no change. And that's a big problem that's been published um, in a few papers and actually leads to an overestimation of change. Another problem, and that's not published so much, uh, is the asymmetric information transfer. So if you have, let's say, the take baseline, you create surfaces on baseline image, take the surface, map it to follow up, and then let it evolve a little longer. That's an, a way of, you know, for example, producing reliable surfaces. So you estimate them once and then map them to follow up and let it evolve. And that's a big problem because that also treats the two images differently, and then you introduce change that may not be there. Because on the second time one, you let it run a little longer than on the first, basically. So that's a bad idea. So we avoid this stuff, um, and I'll show you how. And there are some other problems with other methods. Is sometimes they can do pairwise analysis only, or they only um, compute surfaces, or only white matter, red matter. Free server can do much more. So uh, that's, that's another um, differentiation. So basically, how can we do this? Um, one idea is, of course, we treat all timelines the same. This way, we avoid the bias. Another thing is um, we can create a within subject template. So we take all the time points and kind of average them. This gives us a within subject template image that's kind of the average anatomy of this specific subject. And we use this average to initialize the follow-up time points later on. So it's the trick. Um, we, we compute surfaces and segmentations on this average and then take that information step baseline or any other time point and initialize the, the, uh, all the individual time points. Now for this we need um, two things. It's the robust registration of all these time points and this template estimation step. So I'll give you a little bit of background on the registration and template estimation. Some of this is, there's some math in it, so if you don't like math, just ignore it. And, uh, you know, and then later when I tell you how to do the longitudinal processing, you'll find out how it's actually working. Um, so <clears throat> the goal is uh, we want to get a very accurate registration across time, and it needs to be inverse consistent. That means if you map A to B, um, you want to get the inverse if you map B to A, obviously. But most methods don't do that. So if you actually register the other way around, you'll get not the inverse. And that's problematic, because that's, again, introducing the bias. So we also need to be the registration to be robust in the presence of noise, gradient non-linearities, there may be movement, jaw, tongue, neck, eye, and there may be different cropping planes in the images. And of course, there's some longitudinal change that will be in the images. So we need inverse consistency to keep it uh, unbiased, symmetric. And we also need um, the robust statistics to reduce the influence of these changes, these outliers, like local changes in the brain. So this is uh, one of the equations I have. This is basically tells you how we, how we do this, the symmetry. We map the source and the, and the target target image into a mid-space iteratively. So both images get treated the same, they get mapped to the mid-space, registered, updated, mapped to the next mid-space, and so on. So it's not like mapping the, the uh, source to the target all the time in, internally during the registration, which is usually done. But taking both images, going into the mid-space, and iterating. So both of them are treated the same. That's basically the idea of the symmetry. The idea of the robustness, um, is also pretty easy. So basically, usually you compute a least squares error in your registration. So if you have a large error, it contributes, it has a large contribution to your cost function. You can see in the, in the, in the square, uh, in the, um, the parabola, if you have a large value here, it goes up very high. So a large error locally in your image, a large difference, has a large influence on your, uh, on your registration. So if you have one voxel that is very bright, let's say a million, and like any other image, the registration will try to get rid of this problem, because it's so much more important than the rest of the image. Now, in order to avoid this, we switch to this function. It's a prop to evaluate function. And if you have a large error, it has a limited influence on the registration. You can see that this function flattens up. So that's the math behind it. And the nice thing is this, uh, this really works. It gives us in a registration, it finds the regions that change locally. So this is tumor treatment. And you can see that when you register the follow-up to the baseline image, it finds the yellow-red regions that, that are, uh, have local changes, and it ignores those regions during the registration so that it registers very accurately the rest of the brain, you know, where we don't have local changes. For example, you can see the tumor is responding, and the ventricle is being pulled back 
and you can see that the ventricle is detected, there is a local change, but it's not trying to align this boundary with the previous uh, image, but it's ignoring it, so it comes up with a very accurate registration everywhere else. So if, you com if we compare this to, for example, Fuller, that's not a robust method, um, you can see here on the left side is the, is the Fuller uh, tool, and in this case, it doesn't get the right, uh, accurate registration of the brain. The brain is still wiggling around, but the right, the robust uh, registration uh, finds a very accurate registration. It's uh, in spite of the changes that we have here in the, uh, the neck, the jaw, <coughs> and the cropping planes. So if you want to read more about this registration, it's in this paper, and we tested um, that it's inverse consistent, which was one of the big important things, and we also test uh, the accuracy. It's, uh, and it's more accurate than uh, FLIRT and SPM registration tools. Uh, I don't want to go into the detail of this plot, but basically we did all that. And this is part of the free software uh, package. It's called MRI Robust Register, and you can use this registration on its own. You don't need to run the longitudinal stream to use it, right? You, if you have two images, you want to register them into a bit space in an unbiased fashion, you can call this uh, command. You can also uh, compute these outlier weights, you know, the yellow overlay to find the changes between those images. Um, now if you have more than two images, you need MRI robust template. Oh, there's a question here. Is this also effective with two subjects who are not the same person? Not so much, because then the question is what's outlier, what's not outlier. There will be anatomical changes, so the question was, is it, you know, does this work across subjects, basically? And so if you, yeah, if you have two, uh, two subjects, the registration is ill-defined, you know, it may be, they, you know, they look different. They are different subjects. So it will it will kind of work, um, but we haven't done a big analysis on this because the goal is within subjects. We have an extension that is cross-modality, which is nice to register, let's say, T2 to T1 in, in the presence of changes in the jaw or neck or positioning and these kinds of things. But it will work across subjects, but, you know, the question is what's the right registration? You need to manually look at it, look at FSM and this they will give you different answers, which one is the better one, kind of difficult to tell. So we couldn't really quantify any improvements in, in cross-subject registration. But people used it for us, you know, FI registrations. So it's, it kind of is used for that, but it's not the main goal. Okay, so now we can extend this framework to, and that's the last equations, I promise this. Um, so we'll extend this framework to the, the end time point case. So what happens if you have more than two images then the thing, it gets more tricky. We need to register all these images into some kind of mid space. And this is the, the equations behind this. Basically, we try to find a mean image, like an average of all these images, and the transforms that map each individual image to that average image. And it's done by minimizing this kind of uh, function. So um, now, actually, we will talk about longitudinal processing. So this is probably why you're, uh, you even know, what you're interested in. So the idea in the longitudinal processing is that we have several steps that we need to go through. The first is we create the subject template um, iteratively by doing this, you know, what, we, what I showed on the slide before, this averaging, re-registering. So this is the, the kind of subject template. It's the, the mean image between these, um, and it's in the middle space. So if, you know, if one time on the head is tilted like this, and the other is tilted like this, then this will be straight. And so then the next step is we will process this template through FreeSurfer and get surfaces, get the segmentations. And then we'll transfer this information from this template to all the follow-up uh, time, to all the time points, uh, and then let the surfaces and segmentations evolve on that, uh, on that time point. So the nice thing is here, um, we treat all time points the same. There isn't a specific time point that's selected for any purpose. And the second nice thing is, because we allow everything to evolve freely in the last step, we don't over-regularize it. We don't force it to be similar, we just we allow it to go anywhere it wants to go, based on the image. So that's the two important um, things. So basically this shows the robust, uh, the whole longitudinal stream. So this first step is you take your, your end time points and you run them through FreeSurfer totally independently, as if they were cross-sectional data. So every image is run through FreeSurfer. This will this is the first step, and we call it the cross-sectional step. The second step is we create this base. This is the subject template. It's called base uh, because of historic reasons. It's not the baseline image. It's just the average. So the second step is create this average 
and, uh, and run it through the server. The third step is, so this is one for each subject, and these may be many for each subject, or depending on how many time points you have. This is one for each subject, and then you run all your time points again, uh, but this time you initialize it with the information from the base and a little bit from the cross-sectionals. So for example, we keep the school script the same, uh, the, the affine uh, Talira registration, and you know, we use the information from the base but in lots of steps when we run the longitudinal. The longitudinal will be much faster, usually like five to seven hours, but compared to the regular cross-sectional runs, it may take a little longer, maybe twice as long. So this, these are the commands. So basically, the first one you know already is reckon all your subject ID. Um, this is the ID, and then minus all means it runs everything. Right? This, this, is you, this is what you do for all your images, all time points, all subjects. Then the second step is the creation of this template, and it's slightly different. It has a minus base, and then the base ID, which would be the subject name, you give this name, and then all the time points are passed after that, and then again minus all means to run everything on it. And then the third step is the longitudinal processing, and here you pass the minus long flag, the time point that you're currently processing, and you give the base ID as well so that it knows where to take the information from to, for the initialization. So those three steps are important. And what you end up in the end is a directory that has all this data. So v1, v2, v3 are the individual three time points um, for me. Then v base would be the template, the average. And then this, these directories are created in the third step, in the longitudinal step. And those are the ones that have the information that you're interested in. So you would analyze those directories only. You wouldn't look at v1, v2, v3, and v base because Usually, if you're just interested in analyzing your results, you want the longitudinally processed results. The reliable results will be in these directories. This is just independently running. This is some kind of average. Usually, you're not interested in those things, except if you are editing, which we will talk about in a moment. But if you're not editing, you'll just look at these results and get the, the data. These will be full subject directories, so as you know them, you know, with the stats subdirectory, the surfaces, and so on. So, and then you have, of course, you, you know, you'll have the other subjects in the same directory. So, <clears throat> um, one thing I want to note is since 5.2, free software 5.2, we have the option to process uh, subjects with a single time point through the longitudinal stream. Now that may sound very weird, right? Why would you process a single time point through the longitudinal stream? Now, there's one reason is there is methods of uh, mixed effects models, for example, that can include the data of subjects with a single time point. The subject drops out, this information may still be valuable. Um, you can better estimate the variance across subjects having this data. So why drop this info important information? That's why you would like to keep these subjects and not drop them from your study. Now the other reason and now the reason why you need to run this through the longitudinal stream is if you just ran it through the cross-sectional stream it would be processed differently from the images that ran through the longitudinal stream because there is more processing going on. So in order to make it more comparable, you need to run it through the longitudinal stream. And this is done with these three commands. You run it basically cross-sectionally, you create the template with only this time point in it, and then you initialize the time point again from the template. It's the same processing as for other time points. Yeah. So you would use this, for example, if you had um, 10 subjects, nine of which had five scans and one had only one scan? Yeah. Okay. I mean, usually with this little amount of subjects, it's questionable if this one time one from this one subject is important or not. Um, you know, it's, it's just one time one in one subject. But if you, had, like, if you have any data, you have lots of subjects, you have lots of time ones, and some of them have only one, you could then include it. If it's one subject, I would, I'm not sure if I would go through this effort, because you have to do a linear mixed effects model to make use of this data. So the question if you really want to do this, you know, there's more complex modeling of your data if it's just a single subject. But if it's more, I definitely wouldn't drop those. Why? I mean, but then you need to do more complicated modeling afterwards. Once you have your data, how do you use that data in your statistics? And that's a little more complex. So depending on how far you want to go in the statistics, you may include the subject or not. Okay. Um, so. Basically, a few results. So why is this all so cool? So the first test I did is I did uh, I ran stuff four times. This is 115 subjects with two scans, and they were both taken in the same session. So it's within session scans. There is no anatomical changes, hopefully. Um, so 
basically, what we do is we base one means that I take the first time point, I run it through PreSurfer, take the results, map them to the second one, and let it evolve. This is not symmetric, right? Because this is biased. Take the first one, run it, keep it like it is, and let the second one evolve a little longer with the results from the first. That's exactly what we not wanted to do. Then I do the same, the opposite thing, where I, take, where I run the second one, take the results, map it to the first, and let it evolve a little longer. And that's base two. And then f is long, and f is long reverse is just a regular longitudinal stream, and, and then calling it in the reverse order, you know, reversing the time point order. And now you can see that using the first two methods, we find a severe bias. This is the percent volume changes between these two images. For example, Code or Hippocampus, you can see a like 1.5% increase in the volume of these structures, although this is within the same session, right? This should not be there. This is an artifact of the way you process the data. So, that's, so this tells us it's really important to make sure we're using unbiased methods and not doing some kind of asymmetric way of running one thing and then initializing the second and treating it differently. That's not a good idea. So the longitudinal stream gets rid of these problems in the subcortical and cortical structures. So now we wanted to test, can we, can we accurately find atrophy? So we simulated atrophy in the left hippocampus in a few subjects at, the, at around 2%. And this is the cross-section we process data, and we kind of find the 2% decrease. Uh, more accurately, we can find it with the longitudinal stream, and there is, of course, less variability. Another interesting thing is in the right hippocampus, we didn't do any changes there. So it's the same hippocampus, the same image. In fact, it's like it's exactly the same in the right hemisphere. And still, the cross section stream gives us lots of noise here because of these changes somewhere else in the brain, while the um, longitudinal stream doesn't, doesn't have this variability as much. So we can find atrophy, and we can, we can actually detect it very well. Now, this, um, this is test retest reliability. So if we actually take these two images from before, and we're running them through the cross section stream and the longitudinal stream, this is the 115 subjects again. Uh, within the same session. We don't want to see changes, right? It's the same session. Now, using the cross-sectional stream, the absolute changes, this is the absolute, um, is pretty large, because that's the noise that we're getting. Now, we're using the longitudinal stream, the noise is clearly reduced significantly in all these subcortical and cortical structures. So, it gives us more reliable results. We're getting less error in our, in our test retest study. Uh, the same is true for thickness analysis in the brain. Um, this basically shows us that the thickness is more reliable in the longitudinal stream everywhere in the red and yellow regions, and it's highly significantly better than the cross-sectional stream. So it's just making sure we're doing the right thing here. The nice thing about this is it leads to an increase in power. So if you have a, a study you're interested in some effect, you can reduce the number of subjects approximately by 50% to find the same effect when you use the longitudinal processing instead of just running these images independently for free surfer. So that's, that's the reason, actually, why we do all this, is to be more accurate and you know, either use less subjects or detect smaller changes. Um, this is a real study with um, Huntington's disease data, three time points. Um, there is a control group with 10 subjects. The presymptomatic Huntington's uh, far from onset, this is more than 12 years before estimated time of onset of symptoms. Then uh, uh, a group with uh, subjects that are closer to onset, and then a group with Huntington's disease patients. And if you just run these three time points to the cross-section stream and then compute percent changes per year, you see it's pretty noisy. There is large LRs, there is rarely a, a clear uh, decay here. But running it through the longitudinal stream, you can get really meaningful results. You can see that the atrophy rate usually is accelerating. We can see, we find significant differences between neighboring groups. For example, early in the, in the code and in the cutainment, very early, more than 12 years before onset of the symptoms, we see a, a rate, an atrophy rate change. So they are already speeding up, and, and the, um, the structures are decaying that early, and we can pick it up in this small data set already using this, this longitudinal pipeline. And it's interesting also to note that if you just look at the cross-sectional volumes at baseline in these subjects, there is also a clear, um, of course, there is a clear direction here. But what's this interesting, for example, the putainment, we cannot distinguish the controls from the presymptomatic far from onset. But the atrophy rates already tell us that there is something going on. 
And that's why, again, longitudinal analysis is often so interesting, because we can already see how oh, atrophy starts kicking in, although we may not be able to see a difference because there's so much variability across subjects. Um, anyway, so let me finish this whole thing uh, by giving you a few remarks. There's other sources of bias um, which are important to think about. So, um, for example, if you change your scanner hardware within your longitudinal study, you, you are in trouble because the hardware changes will, will affect your images and you will find changes that are based, because, I mean, based on the hardware change, not because of the disease or whatever you're studying. And I, I wrote head call, it's a part of the hardware fiddle. I don't know if the pivot changes uh, will affect your study, but who knows, right? I mean, this is something we should test. And I've noticed um, in one study, I've noticed differences. Uh, it looked like if, if the head is in a different position in the scanner, this may affect the image as well. It's very small, but it's there. Then the other thing is the um, software. So if you, if you upgrade your scanner, you may get a different software, depending on how much changes they build into these softwares. Although they tell you nothing changed, the image looks different. We had problems with shimming algorithms that produce different looking images in an upgraded software. So if you have a longitudinal study, you see a decay and suddenly whoop, it jumps up and then it goes down again. And that's the software update. This can happen. There's a scanner drift and calibration that always happens. The scanners get old, they get recalibrated. If the recalibration is done incorrectly, you'll see a scaled brain. That's very simple and problematic. Usually it doesn't happen, but it can happen. There's, of course, other things like motion levels across groups, specifically Huntington. People move more, or older patients, they move more. Motion can affect the images in pre-surface, so you'll get thinner cortices in those situations. And then there may be a difference in the hydration level of your, of your subjects. This is a study that we did with Andreas Barge, and 14 subjects, they were dehydrated overnight in 12-hour period, and you can see that there is a cortical thinning in these regions. It's significant, um, and we rehydrated them during during the scan session for one hour with one liter, and uh, yeah, and there's thickening of the brain again, and it's also significant. And this is at the order of like up to five percent. Right? So hydration is is an important thing, and yeah. uh, may be important to control for it. I give them something to drink an hour before, and you know, something like that. I don't know. I mean, I'm not a medical doctor. I just find these things and tell people. So, <laughs> what you do with this information. Yeah. Yeah. And then another thing is, it's important that methods can also find increases. You know, I've seen um, longitudinal processing screens that always find decrease in brains. That's kind of weird, right? I mean, you want to have a tool that can also find some thickening if it's there, right? You don't want a tool that's biased towards thinning. So this is good that we can actually also detect the opposite. You can find out by reversing time points. So if you have another longitudinal tool, you want to try it out, just uh, you know, run your study and then reverse time points and run it again, see if you get the opposite. That's a good test. So anyway, there's a few things that will be probably come at some point into the longitudinal stream. For example, some nonlinear warps, some joint intergradical uh, volume estimation, and some better normalization steps, <coughs> fitness computation but it may still take a few years until all of this is in there. Now, there is some web pages about the longitudinal processing and a page with the publications. I also have a few papers here. I put them up uh, in the back. If anyone wants to take a paper uh, on the longitudinal processing stream. Um, and uh, basically, that's it. We'll be switching to the tutorial in a moment. And maybe before I finish the talk, I'll quickly go through these steps here that are related to the tutorial. Um, so basically what you do in the tutorial is you learn how to process the three stages, cross sectional based and long. This is basically what I showed you on the slides, these are the three commands. Um, you look at some post-processing, but a very simple post-processing, um, not the complicated mixed effects modeling, because that would be a little too complicated. There is some tools in FreeSurfer MATLAB tools that do this mixed effects modeling. So you can you can use those. But uh, what we do here is a little bit less complicated, and this can be used if you have approximately the same time points in all your subjects, if they are also approximately the same distance apart. In those, in those situations, same time points, same number of time points, same distance between time points, then this is fine. If you have highly variable, you know, some subjects with one, some with ten time points, and spacing is very different, you, you wouldn't run this analysis. So uh, we will compute the atrophy rate within each subject. That's the first step. 
um, this reduces all your time points to a single number, right? You have thickness measurements in five time points, and now you have a single number for each subject, each subject which is the rate of change at that location in the cortex or this ROI. So we reduce all these time points to a single number, that's the first step. And the second step then is to run a group analysis on this single measurement. Similar to your thickness analysis that you've done today is now you're comparing atrophy rates across groups instead of thickness across groups, it's atrophy rate across groups. Um, in the tutorial, we'll do two time points and we'll do the rate of the same change. Um, then we'll look at manual editing. So manual editing in the longitudinal stream is a little more complicated than in the cross-sectional stream because you have all these three stages, cross-sectional, base, longitudinal. So where do you edit what, right? That's a big question that I always get and it's kind of unclear. It's not really, um, there is not really an easy, easy story. Basically, the idea is you start editing the cross-sectionals, you also check the base, and then the longitudinal should be fine. There shouldn't be any editing necessary in the longitudinal step. That's the basic story. But sometimes you can get around this, and you can only edit the base, the template. And this is nice, because if you have five time points for a subject, you just need to edit one, the base, um, and not all the five time points in the base, right? So for some, for some edits, you may get away doing them. Uh, that saves time. Uh, there is a wiki page on how to do longitudinal edits, and some of this is in the tutorial. So you'll learn those things. I don't know, you probably won't get through the whole thing. It's there. The editing takes a little time, but it's all online. So if you want to review this at home, uh, you, you, you have it there. OK, I think that's almost it. This is the last slide. So in the tutorial, we, we talked about a few things that may not be uh, known by everyone. So we talked about the temporal average. If you have four time bonds, let's say this, 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 and this one, you can see the last one is further apart from, from the earlier ones. Now the simple average of these four, uh, four data points would be this black circle. The temporal average is this red circle. It's basically at the middle time uh, in this linear fit into your, into your data. That's what I, what, what I call, uh, call the temporal average. So like how would the subject, what would be the thickness if this was a linear behavior here, and this is at the middle time. It's kind of an extension of the average, it's a temporal average. And then there is a concept called rate of change. So what's the rate? The rate is in millimeter per year, uh, and it's the slope of this line. So this is the age in years, this is thickness in millimeter, the slope is millimeter per year. It's like how much um, volume, in this case, how much thickness gets lost per year. Right? That's, the, that's the rate. Then there is something called percent change. And if you say percent change, you always have to say with respect to what? Right? Percent with respect to what? With respect to time point one is usually the, the, the normal way of doing it. So you would take time point one and divide the rate by the thickness of time point one. This gives you a percent change with respect to baseline. Now the baseline measurement is usually noisy. So it may not be a very good idea to use it to normalize your percentages. So instead of doing that, you could also compute the symmetrized percent change, which gives you the percent with respect to this temporal average. It's kind of a more robust way of computing percent. So those are the different options uh, you have. There's, I think there's even more options, but we won't go through all of them in the, in the tutorial. But um, this is the basic idea behind those things, if you compute change, if you compute rates. Okay, so that's, um, that's it. And, um, I thank you very much for your attention.